Now, the last movement is a mad dash, and a very exciting mad dash at that. Now, do you hear the way he just extends the end of the phrase? Ronald, perhaps you play it for us once again, this time putting in the cadence where it might be obvious. There we are. Wouldn't that be nice? But of course, Mozart ups the ante once again by extending the end of it and therefore making you listen. Make more space there, please, into that first forte dotted minimum. Yep, by da da there. Okay, straight in on the orchestral entry, please. Ready and. <coughs> Now, the texture we're into here is pure Beethoven. This is exactly the kind of texture that Beethoven is justly famous for, creating an absolute free song of energy and excitement out of just little kind of semitonal clashes. Um, let's play strings alone, in fact, violins alone, just from 30. <laughs> And if we add the winds and brass over the top of that, you really get the sense of something that's building somewhere really extraordinary. Now, the entry of the piano here, again, new material, but interestingly, it's exactly the same chord structure as that first entry in the first movement, a wonderful sense of Mozart referring back to what we remember having heard before. Let's hear the two side by side. So by doing that, by putting those two themes so close together, he's ensuring that the audience are really listening, that they're engaging with their heads as well as their hearts, and patting themselves on the back for having jolly good memories. Now, the second subject in this movement is, well, it undergoes three transformations, very, very subtle ones, but enough to sort of distort it and change its character. The first one you get is in the nice sunny key of F major. Now listen to it, clothed in D minor. Did you hear how he sharpened it? Let's play it once more. And there's one more transformation, which is in the last episode of the whole movement, where it's once more in the major, but it sounds curiously different. Let's do it with the bassoon bar before. There's something sort of forcedly jubilant about that, which we'll explore a bit more in a minute. I wanted to talk again about dialogue. Dialogue now very specifically between three players, between the piano, the flute, and the bassoon, again unimaginable really before Mozart. Of 
course, that works extraordinarily well on its own, but Mozart just makes it that much more brilliant by adding a kind of mist of harmony, sort of gossamer harmony in the strings, just, just on the edge of hearing. Let's play it once more. <laughs> Now, there's another mighty cadenza in this movement. Very exciting it is, too, I know, because I've heard more or less improvisation already that we're going to hear. But at the end of the cadenza, he comes back to the theme, exactly as you'd expect, but without the orchestra, which is not what you'd expect. And then he leaves us on a cliffhanger. <laughs> That diminished chord could kind of lead anywhere. What he does is creates a coda which is starkly jolly, if you see what I mean. It's in the major key. We're going to play it slightly quicker than the overall pulse of the movement. So it only helps to underline that sense that it's like, OK, Dad, everything is OK now. I've shown you my box of tricks, the good, the bad, the pretty, and the ugly. And now we're just going to have rather a trite but sweet ending. Let's hear it from the same place. As if just to complete this kind of nursery world analogy, this small child inside, you get these extraordinary sort of like toy trumpet moments, again, sort of out of the nursery, which come from nowhere, feel very bizarre, and I think it can only be really understood in the light of this sort of view. Let's play from 395. <laughs> So, that's my view of the piece. Obviously, you're completely at liberty, and I hope you will make your own version of it. Perhaps you already have your own version of it. But when we're performing it now, just invest your thoughts as well as your heart with some of these ideas. A composer, without doubt, at the top of his form, in full command of everything, able really to do anything. And the whole piece is a succession of moments when he's saying, look at this, and this, and this, another thing, another thing. That's what makes it so extraordinary. But for me, he's more than ever before connected with the child within and all the tantrums and fury and wild love that goes with it. 